the future is not about treating disease when you get them. It's about preventing diseases so that you don't get it. And the future is about targeting aging. So we don't have to talk about which disease. It's all of them. <laughs> all the diseases that are being caused by aging will be modulated. Hello, everybody. My name is Jose Navarro Betancourt, and I am the scientific director of Quadrascope. We invest in early stage biotechnology companies that aim to dramatically extend human health span by treating the hallmarks of aging. The following video is an interview with Dr. Nir Barsilai, a leading figure in geroscience who has a remarkable bio. So I won't do it justice by trying to present it in under a couple of minutes. In the description below, you can read about Dr. Barsilai's positions, affiliations, research initiatives, awards, and the public engagements in the emerging field of longevity biotech. We are lucky to have his support as part of Quadroscope's advisory board. Now, this is my conversation with Dr. Nir Barsila. And uh, let's begin with uh, a little bit about your background. You were a successful medical doctor in the Israeli army. So what sparked your interest in doing research in glucose metabolism and later in aging? Well, well it was uh, about aging, but it started much before uh, the army. It started with uh, the fact that uh, I, I, I saw my grandfather. He was my age now, but he looked very different. He looked probably 30 years older than I look now. And... And he, you know, he was obese and he was very slow, but he talked, told me about what he did when he was young. And all of a sudden it hit me, you know, they say that kids have imagination, but kids don't really look at their grandparents and see themselves becoming that, right? They're like, oh, we don't know where they're coming from, but you know, we're different. And I think it's this part that really was part of, of a, of what's the big, what, what is the big questions on life? You know, why are we, we becoming old? That was always much more interesting to me than who has high cholesterol, who has high glucose. You, you know, you can take people and you you wouldn't know the answers for them, but you know who's young and, you, and who's old. And then you see that actually the people who are old are the people who are getting high blood pressure and cholesterol and stuff. So the aging, was much more a curiosity for me than any of the other parts of medicine. And I went to be an endocrinologist, but just because there are so many endocrine changes with aging that I thought initially you just replace all the hormones and you fix aging, which, which happens to be wrong and, and, and opposite sometimes. So Nir, you are a founding member of multiple organizations involved in geroscience and longevity from different angles. And it would be interesting to learn more about them directly from you. So let's begin with the emerging sector of the longevity biotechnology industry. Can you please explain the mission of the Longevity Biotechnology Association? Yes. Um, to deal with longevity is different in many ways than to deal with other diseases. Basically, you have a longer a longer pathway, uh, you know, to develop drugs that you'll call aging. And, and actually you need to cut it to parts. You really need first to develop something that will treat a specific disease. And then you can think how to make it, well, everybody should be on this drug because it will delay your aging. Okay. So it's a very, it's a longer, uh, a longer pathway and it's a, 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 and 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 there's a thought of how are you going to achieve that so that's that's one part the second part is that um, what we are trying to do uh, as companies who are members of our longevity biotech association is to target those what we call the hallmarks of aging to become a hallmark of aging, you have to show that it it changes when you're when you're aging, when you're old, and if you fix it in animal models, 
then you get an extended of health span and lifespan. That's how you become a, a hallmark. But there's something very interesting with the hallmarks and that's they're interconnected between each other. So you can fix one and also affects the others. And this is very important because you might target one hallmark, but actually the disease that you might choose as the first round of heat can be because it also affects another hallmark. Okay, so um, I think it's important to educate companies, also educate investors, that if they um, actually invest in, in longevity biotech, they have many options to target first and then to target second. This is a good time for a recap about what a hallmark of aging is. So the hallmarks of aging are biological processes that have three characteristics. First, they are associated with aging. This means that these processes change and become more evident as humans age. Second, in laboratory animals, accelerating the hallmarks of aging also accelerates aging and age-related diseases. And the third characteristic, perhaps the most relevant one, is that inhibiting or fixing these processes slows down, stops, or potentially reverses aging and the organ damage associated with aging. So by targeting the hallmarks of aging, longevity biotech companies develop interventions that can treat or prevent any disease where aging is a risk factor. Um, another issue as an example is biomarkers. We want to see actually that our um, drugs or our intervention is really important. Um, importantly, that, that it's going to delay aging. You know, you, you cannot start a phase three trial, a uh, you know, billion dollars every time when you really need to in phase two trial to understand what are the biological markers doing? And for that, we need to coordinate the, the laboratories to take biomarkers that are relevant now, but also to store plasma and blood in order to have a resource available and that they can come back and do some discovery that will be important for their drug developments. So, so those are some, some of the issues we're dealing with. Also education, podcast, uh, membership, maybe meetings and uh, other things that we're providing to our members. So will, will the Longevity Biotechnology Association have like a biorepository of these uh, samples from patients that, uh, that companies can uh, access? Uh, no, I, I don't think that's our okay. plan. Our, our, plan but... our plan is to tell, look, if, if you have a biotech, then you want to make sure or you have a, a venture capital. You want to make sure that each one of your companies has first of all an informed consent to say we're taking this blood or and we we can use we are unidentified but we can use this uh, to measure things in the future that okay first of all second have a minus 80 freezer where you're going to freeze plasma serum uh, blood okay and and then we can help coordinate if proteomics is going to be the most important thing that maybe everybody should send it to the same mm -hmm. company so that we get a lot of, uh, so the technology was, wouldn't get in the way. In other words, a lot of, of ways to think of how those biomarkers can be important for your company individually, but also used in the field more effectively. Okay, so the, the LVA will um, help companies coordinate their endpoints uh, so that we have a standard for, for what's the minimum requirements to, to say that a treatment uh, targets aging, correct? Potentially, right. So now uh, on the line of biomarkers, let's uh, move on into the clinical aspect of, of longevity, of longevity medicine. You're also a founding member of the Healthy Longevity Medicine Society. Can, can you please tell us about the mission of this uh, society? Yes. So, you know, the idea is, of course, that if you target the aging process, 
uh, you will stay healthy for longer and it will also also impact the society. We really basically want that the hospital will turn into clinics that prevents you from being hospitalized, okay? Um, how do we do it? Well, first of all, um, there, there, there are promises that has to be realized and there are promises or hopes that are on the way. Uh, so we have medis medications that we can use. You know, any doctor can repurpose metformin, for example. There are medications that we could use and there are medications that are being developed by Longevity Biotech Association members and by, by others. There are supplements that, uh, that, that are being developed. And the basic idea is that we have to maximize your health at any age, okay? If you have blood pressure of 120 over 80, yeah, it's fine, but we know that 110 over 70 is better over a certain age. And by the way, not so good also at another age, but you know, you can maximize your blood pressure. A LDL of 100 is okay, but you know, 70 is better. Um, if you walk, a, 10,000 steps a day, it's okay, but can you walk maybe 13,000 steps a day? Um, there are many ways to maximize your health and you could do it by exercising, by nutrition, by sleep, by you know, by not being lonely. There's lots of way, things that we have to do, but you can do some of them with drugs, existing drugs or future drugs. So this is what the, the, the longevity doctors are going to be trained for. And we already have an, a medical education program. You can get a CME uh, points for taking the courses that we're putting out online. And there's lots of other activities like their grand rounds and other things that we are planning. But this society is registered in Switzerland. It started with a center in Singapore and, um, and it's catching on you know, on many clinics around um, around the world, basically. So, so do, do you think uh, longevity medicine will be uh, a specialty on its own or will it belong to, say, endocrinology, uh, to internal medicine, family medicine? You, you know, that, that's, a really, uh, that's a really good question. So first of all, there is longevity medicine, okay? I have a longevity doctor. Okay, <laughs> there are people who knows to maximize your health, who are trying lots of things, who are putting you a lot of things and doing it in a responsible way. So it's really to train those and the next generation and tell them this is going to be big thing. Um, in the future, I actually think that longevity medicine will be administered by a nurse. Okay, I, I think initially, it should be its own society because we have to set up the parameters. We have to set up the boundaries, the advice and other things. But I think that there'll be longevity doctors, but for the public, it'll be clinics that there'll be nurse practitioners and the nurse practitioner will say, well, you have to do this and we have to do that. And, and, and this is how primary care will really adapt to things that are going to be, I think, simple and safe. Got, got it, got it. And um, another question that comes to mind is that uh, historically other healthcare specialties like nutrition or like sports science have embraced longevity and neuroscience and have been giving this type of advice, but clinical medicine have, has been somehow slower to adopt it. So what has caused medical doctors to, to become more involved in this field uh, at this day and age? This, does it, this mean that we have more resources now to intervene, more biomarkers? What caused this, uh, yeah. this shift? That, that's, that's a good question. I think, look, if, if to talk in a pessimistic way, what we don't have is success, okay? Tame study hasn't been done. We cannot say that we actually delayed aging and its diseases in a clinical trial, okay? Our success is really based on the fact that 
if you're a mice, we are set. We can increase your lifespan by variety of way, okay? Um, and those drugs have been working on a variety of animals. They are touching the biology of aging. The biology of aging is similar among, among species. So, um, so we, we have the we we have the knowledge but we don't have a success um, and it didn't prevent people to say you know what even without success we can do things and i i and i think there's a growing uh, number of uh, doctors that want and are ready to do things and know that this is going to be the future okay the future is not about treating disease when you get them. It's about preventing diseases so that you don't get it. And the future is about targeting aging. So we don't have to talk about which disease. It's all of them. <laughs> all the diseases that are being caused by aging will be modulated. That, that sounds great. Let's, let, you mentioned the, the TAME trial. Let's, uh, let's talk a little bit about it on, on a high level. So the TAME trial, for context, is based on the premise that aging is the root cause of numerous diseases, and treating aging can prevent these diseases. So if this trial is successful, what implications will it have on the regulatory framework of the FDA? Well, it's the other way around. It was designed for the regulatory framework, okay? okay? Because actually everything we're doing in TAME, there are data on that already, you know? a lot of clinical trial and associated trial. We know that people who take metformin in trials or associated study, they have less diabetes and cardiovascular disease and, and cancer and cognitive decline and Alzheimer and less mortality. With this all have been done and that's why we are very sure of the success. It hasn't, packaged to, it hasn't been packaged together for the FDA to say, we have a cluster we have an intervention that will change a cluster of disease. We're going to prevent them from showing up or delaying them significantly. We haven't done, we haven't shown that the FDA and we talked with the FDA and then we showed them and they said, yeah, absolutely. We can, we can do this study. We can, I mean, we can do this study and they would look at it. By the way, the FDA, when we talked with them, they were not buying that we're targeting aging. Um, they weren't going to call aging a disease and we, we don't want to call aging a disease either. But if we're having an intervention that delays not one, but two, but three, fourth conditions, they'll say, that's okay. Okay. Uh, so, and then of course, a uh, few things will happen. First of all, metformin is the cheapest drug in the market. So, if people, the people were saying, you know, longevity is only for rich people. No, no. The first drug will be for the poorest of the poor people and they need most help. Okay. The, the poor people live 20, 30 years everywhere in the same cities, everywhere they live less than the rich people. Okay. So it'll be available treatment. Second, the pharmaceuticals now will have a template of a study and a way to move forward to sell their drugs as a gerotherapeutics. Okay, so this those things will happen immediately. Okay, so the, the TEM trial will uh, facilitate uh, the approval of longevity treatments within the current regulatory framework of the FDA. Um, right, and, right. But the, they can call it whatever they call. We call it aging. They can call it whatever they, can they call it's like porn. We see, we see it. We know. Okay, <laughs> we don't care. So, do you think eventually insurance companies will uh, will cover the cost of these zero therapeutics? Uh, because potentially, I mean, even if they are very cheap, uh, you you sh you are going to take them for a very long period of time. So, will insurance companies companies cover this? I I don't think this is a problem for metformin because it will be the cheapest drug in the That's formulary. And not only that, look, the insurance company want the people to be healthy and come less to the hospital, okay? So I don't think not on the science level and not on the price level, metformin will be a problem. The thing is that there are other interventions, there are other drugs, and any drugs will 
will be like it is today. You, you know, it'll be expensive as long as the companies have the patent. And after that, it'll be much more affordable. And the more they're used, the more affordable they become. Okay. So I I, I think it's not different. I Yeah, I, I'm sure that some of the interventions are going to be expensive, but, uh, but for a while. But in the meantime, you have met for me. Let's shift gears a bit and uh, talk about your, your own uh, research. Um, you, you led the Super Agers Initiative, uh, launched over 20 years ago in 1998, and it has the most extensive database of supercentenarian families. What are some biological processes that your group has identified as promoters of longevity? So so few things before. Our centenarians don't only live uh, healthier, they, they longer they live healthier and they uh, contracting their morbidity. In other words, they're sick very little time at the end of their life. So this is what we want, right? We want to live healthier. Maybe as a side effect, we'll live longer <laughs> and then we'll die one day. Okay, 30% of them don't have any diseases when they're 100, they don't wake up in the morning. Okay, so first of all, there's a proof of concept that we have people like that and we have to, to achieve that. Second thing that's interesting about centenarians, they didn't interact with the, with the environment the way we should. 50% uh, of them were smoker, 50% of them were obese, 50% of them didn't even move, didn't do housework for exercise. 2% were uh, vegetarian. So for them, it's not about, it's not because they did something with the environment. They didn't, which really means they had genes that protected them. And, and I'll just give example. 60% of our centenarians have, have some genetic defect that impairs their growth hormone axis. You know, there's one growth hormone, but many growth hormones. Um, and 60% of them have deficiency in growth hormone. Now, um, the reason that it's important is that we actually need a lot of growth hormone to get to reproduction, to have a big body, to be able to reproduce and all that. But when we start having our breakdown of aging, you know, when you move over the age of 50, you need to change the energy from growth to uh, fighting the breakdown. It doesn't make sense that when you're breakdowning, you're trying to build other tissues and cells. And, and so across nature, it happens, you know, the big dogs live shorter than the, the little dogs and the ponies live longer than the thoroughbred. And when you do things like that in the lab, every time you have more growth hormone, they die sooner. And every time you take off the growth hormone, they live longer. So this makes a sense. And this is example of some things that are happening. So for example, metformin actually decreased one of the growth hormone, IGF-1, as, as part of what it's doing. It's not the only thing that it's doing. And there are other drugs that can target uh, IGF specifically that have de been developed in humans. So it's example of how we our research has been uh, relevant to uh, treatment uh, in old people. So t talking about uh, growth hormone, um, the biohacking community commonly uses growth hormone supplements as uh, pro-longevity treatments with uh, somehow um, promising results. D do you believe that uh, in the long term, growth hormone supplementation is detrimental? Yes, I don't think that there's promising results. And I don't know if you saw a promising result. I think part of our problem is that everybody, in particular the public, doesn't know to distinguish between clinical studies and just hype, okay? Mm -hmm. or, or somebody who said, since I'm on growth hormone, I became younger by 20 years, okay? Uh, growth hormone has, uh, the, why is growth hormone selling? Because it's like politic, which means it takes the fat away out of your face and your muscles, so you look stronger. It actually, there's no, uh, any proof that it, it improves muscle action, okay? Or muscle mass. It just looks like that because you, you, you do fat. But from the, the studies that we know, uh, 
it's clear that growth hormone is not what you give to elderly. You can give it to young people and I think it can have the benefit, but not to elderly. And I think when people say we have data, they just say we have data. I didn't see any study. And you, if you have a, a study where elderly were treated with growth hormone in placebo control uh, study, I would be happy to see it. There are, pap there are papers like that that eventually concluded that it's not safe to use growth hormone in elderly. So uh, this is really the state of the heart, the, the art. It is interesting to mention that short treatment cycles with growth hormone may help to improve the function of the immune system by regrowing the thymus, which is an organ of the immune system that shrinks with age. Very briefly, in the TRIM study, 10 male volunteers received a personalized combination of growth hormone, metformin, and the sex hormone DHEA for one year. This combination of treatments increased the size of the thymus, improved some immune function parameters, and reduced their biological age measured by epigenetic clocks. The results were published in Aging Cell in 2019, and they were covered in mainstream news. A larger study that includes female volunteers is on the way. Remember that TRIM tested a combination of treatments with different mechanisms of action in a limited number of participants for one year. It is unclear whether long-term growth hormone supplementation is safe. Um, so um, some, some scientists propose a, a fixed limit to, to the human lifespan at around 120 years. Um, is there any evidence of a genetic limit to human lifespan? I, I think so. You know, we uh, Jan Vick from Einstein had a nature paper where with modeling, he said that maximum lifespan is about 115 years. And of course, there are people who lived 122, but you know, we're talking yes. about, about, you know, statistical models. So I'm, I'm, I'm accepting that I think our lifespan as human species is in 115 years. We die now, uh, you know, at age 76. So we have 30, 40 years to realize, right? Before, we even have to ask if we should change something very fundamental. And, and by the way, I believe that, you know, in future decades, we'll be able to pass this. I don't think it needs to be an obstacle, but it's an obstacle now. And we have to think about it. Our centenarians are within those 115 years, but they already live 30 years more than, <laughs> than their cohort. So... Yeah, I think I think there's a, a limit to human lifespan. I think that it may be not, not going to be an obstacle. And I think that uh, we have a lot of years to realize between this life, lifespan potential already. And, and, and you mentioned that the super centenarians in the super ageers study um, suffer from chronic diseases later in life for a short period of time. So how do you distinguish genes involved in preventing age-related diseases and genes involved in promoting longevity? So, so I'll give you one example to show kind of the coolness and but complexity also. Um, you can be born with an ApoE4 genotype for Alzheimer, which gives you a pretty good risk of developing Alzheimer when you're 70 and to kill you when you're 80. We have couple of centenarians that have ApoE4, they're homozygous for ApoE4, and and they're not they're not uh, they're they're not dead <laughs> and 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 they're not demented, although they had more years to develop dementia. Our, our centenarians have genes that slows their aging process. And by slowing their aging process, they are also protecting from the genetic of many, many diseases. One of our cool paper was to show in 44, uh, uh, 34 of our first centenarians, we found an average of seven genotypes that should have caused them a disease and it didn't. You know, so slowing aging is something that will also overcome the genetic of specific diseases, not always, but sometimes at least. 
So I, I, I think I think that's the promise, the longevity genes that slow aging will also be helpful against the diseases that might cause age-related disease. Is aging and diseases of aging have the same uh, or share some of the same mechanisms? So Nir, um, this has been a very interesting conversation. Um, but I, I would like to ask you one last question. What is the best advice that uh, you have ever received in your career? Um, so let me, let, uh, okay, let, let me change it a little bit. And I'll tell you one advice that I received that I think is the worst okay. for the world. And that's don't go against the wind, okay? Um, I, I think if we want to achieve something, we have to go against the wind, <laughs> okay? Otherwise, we're not doing something important. And um, and I think if you if you find something that you want to do, and people tell you you're not you're never going to make it, uh, you sh you should try and do it because that's the only way to succeed. It's to go against the wind. So so this is the worst advice that that I give. But you know when when people are coming for me for advice, I usually say, let me tell you what I would do. So we can get it off the table because now we have to talk about what you would do and you're not me. You don't have the same personality. You don't, you know, you're, you're much smarter than me. Okay, you're, okay. So we have to talk about, about you. Um, in other words, the advice are personalized advice. And, and there's no way to really go, give a good advice that will hold for everyone, just like we don't have one medicine that doesn't have trade-offs when we give it. That, uh, that, that's a that's some good piece of advice. So Nir, uh, thank you very much for taking the time to, to, talk, to talk with me. This was very interesting and uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much. If you found this video interesting and you would like more people to see this kind of content, please click on the like button and consider subscribing to our channel. And also visit our website, quadroscope.com, to read about interesting developments in longevity biotech. Goodbye.